So, here we are this morning. Uh, we're continuing in our series in the book of Exodus. I don't know about you, but I'm really enjoying this series. Um, every time I read something or I listen to a sermon or talk, I find something new, something I didn't know. But for me, the most amazing thing is seeing Jesus in those Old Testament stories. When Jesus says, the scriptures testify about me, he really means it. You can see it. So today, we move on to Exodus chapter 16. And if you've got your Bibles open, open them up. If you've got, your, if you've got the Bible on the phone, do the same thing. Now, but if you'd like to, if you bear with me, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start at the end of chapter 15. I know Emma talked about this last week, but I'd like to read the end of uh, chapter 15 because what it has to say has resonance as it moves into chapter 16. And the passage tells us this, starting in the end of chapter 15, verse 22. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of your Lord, your God, and do that, do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs of water, 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. And we move on to chapter 16. They set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in, in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people should go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they, what, what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And, Lord, and the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat. And in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am Lord, your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was, the, there, there were, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as, fine as frost on the ground. When the people saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For well, they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. 
This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. And whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over till the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, This is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over lay aside to be kept until morning. So they laid it aside till morning as Moses commanded them. It did not stink and there were no worms in it. Moses said, eat it today for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it. In the field, find it in the field. Six days you should gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and my laws? See, the law has given you the Sabbath. The Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made of honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it. Place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. The people, in, the people of Israel ate the manna 40 years till they came to a habitable land. They, eat the manna, they ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. So in summary, where we are at the moment is the Israelites have been delivered out of slavery by God. The Israelites have been baptised in the Red Sea by God. God, as we read in, read in the song of praise that uh, we heard a lot, that Emma spoke about last week, has dealt with the Egyptians. Have another look at that song of praise. Note there's no mention of any Egyptian raising a sword against the, any Israelite ra raising a sword against the Egyptians. It's all God's work. It's his alone. And quite rightly, that praise is all to him. At this point, just, bit, just as they leave the Red Sea, the Israelites, we read, are singing praises to God. And then they start their wanderings in the wilderness. Now, if we look back at Exodus chapter 13, the Israelites knew where they were going. Because it says, when, in chapter 13, it says, When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you, to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you. So the Israelites knew where they were going. But they're not there yet. The Israelites at this point are a stateless. At the point they leave Egypt, there are people without a home, without a country. As a Christian, do you sometimes feel like that? That you've been delivered from sin through Jesus, that you have your salvation, that you know where you're going, but until that time you're almost wandering in the wilderness. I don't know if you've ever done this, but if you've ever got, had a globe of the world, have you spun it round really quickly and then stopped it with your finger to say, and see which country it lands on? It might be, it might be a sort of thing to say, well, I'll spin it round, I'll put my finger on there, and I'm going to go to that country next holiday, or I'm going I'm to visit that country at some point. Or you've blindfolded yourself and tried to stick a pin in a map. 
we've got a globe at home. Um, it's really quite cool. It lights up. Um, and when, it, when, when you put the light on, it, it shows something different to what it, what it shows when the, when the light's off. Um, and yesterday, Seth and I, were, my son, we were talking about what happens, but like there's some sort of a evil deity that if you spin it around really quickly, what will be happening to all the people on that, on that globe? You know, the <laughs> hanging, on for, hanging on for dear life, it spun around, then you suddenly stop it and then see what happens. Did, did anyone, anyone uh, uh, I'm a bit immature, but when I used to work in London, we used to do a thing called tube surfing, which meant you stood at the end of the carriage when the tube was going, you didn't hold on to anything, and you sort of tried, and then when the tube stopped, uh, yeah, it could be could be quite dangerous. It was great fun, great fun. But there's one thing, on our, on our map, on our maps or on our globe, there's one country we'll never find, and that's the kingdom of heaven. So we're wandering around in this wilderness of the globe, but the kingdom of the heaven's not there. For a Christian, the promised land for us is not in the here and now. The promised, fla- the promised land for us is that eternal inheritance the newer heaven and the new earth. Ever taken a family road trip? Uh, I'm going to say this with apologies to my wife. My amazing wife, who is so organised, and everything, wherever we go somewhere, she's always got it organised, everything's done, and then me and the kids rock up, and the whole thing starts to fall apart. But we go on a Clark family road trip to see my folks. My folks live up in Suffolk. It's about a four or five hour um, journey away. Um, And there's quite a bit of pain to go through to get there, we find. You know, there's the the organisation to actually get in the car. There's the fact that Jean is really organised and she'll be sat in the car waiting to go and me and the kids will be saying, oh, I've forgotten that, I need to go and find that. I can see, I I can hear her frustrations. And there'll be a, a, you know, a few full starts. You know, we'll get down, we'll drive, we'll turn the car around, we'll drive down the bottom of our lane, we'll drive back up again, and then somebody will say, I've forgotten that, back in the house again, go and get that. I've forgotten to close that up, I've forgotten to lock that. But when we get, finally get settled and we get on our way, there's a sense of excitement. The destination, when we go and see my folks, is the kids know it's going to be fun. There are good things at the end of that journey. They know that the, their grandparents are going to spoil them rotten. Jean and I know that we're going to be fed, that we're going to be able to absolve some responsibility for a few days. And it's, you know, there's a real sense of excitement. We've got, we, we start the journey, we've got our food, we've got our water... Everything's got battery life in it. Phones and tablets have all got battery life in it. Then a couple of hours into the journey, normally as we get just before the Dartford Tunnel and the traffic starts to slow down, you start to hear this. Dad, the battery's run out on my tablet. Mum, I'm thirsty or I'm hungry. Dad, I need to pee. And then... We get through the Dartford Tunnel, and just as we get to the A12, the A12 is the road that runs up to Suffolk, you hear the the fatal words. Are we there yet? (laughs) Or how much longer? And then the grumbling starts. We're all getting a bit tired. We're all getting a bit thirsty. We just want to be, we just want the journey to be over, over quickly at that point. You see, the destination's really exciting. We know at the end of that, there's, there's really good things. There's a really exciting time. There's, 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 you know, it's going to be a great time together with family. But the journey is necessary. We have to do the journey to get to the end point. I've got a friend um, uh, that I still keep in contact with school, and uh, he was one of three brothers... And their road trips were horrific because the point of their road trips when they used to go on a long journey was they used to, if you think, in the 1980s, quite small cars, and they would sit, um, the youngest brother used to sit in the middle with his legs up on the transmission tunnel as it used to run through the back of the car. They used to sit in it, and, and three in a row. And the whole point of their journeys was to inflict as much pain on each other as they could on the journey until one of them would crack and one of them would cry out to mum and 
plead for, um, uh, plead for, for, for something to be done about his bro their brothers. I mean, the whole household was fairly, was, was like that. I mean, it wasn't just road trips. There was sibling violence was, was a thing. But the road trips were, were particularly horrific, he recalls. And um, the, pa the patience of the parents was amazing. They, it took a lot of provocation before mum and dad would actually crack. And these are the sort of things, this sort of, it, it, it's a bit of a, perhaps a bit of a joke, but these are the sort of things we start to see at the end of chapter 15 into chapter 16. The Israelites come out of the other side of the Red Sea, banging tambourines and singing praises to God. S chapter, the, the song says, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. But then Moses makes them start on their journey into the desert. And after three days' journey, in which they have no water, at this point, I bet they weren't singing praises. And when they find water, they can't drink it because it's bitter. And then we read that the people grumbled against Moses. What are we going to drink? Moses, we read, cries out to God, who provides a log or a branch that when Moses throws it in the water the water becomes sweet and drinkable. Now, apparently, there, are, there is a tree in that area where if, I think it's the seeds of the tree that if you throw it in sort of um, dirty water or something, it will, it will purify water. It's a natural purifying thing. Um, it was in one of the commentaries I read, which is amazing. So God's provi God provides. But then look at what he says in chapter, in, in chapter 15 at the end there. He tests the people. He asks them to diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God. Now, the word diligently is the important thing. Because this is a call to trust, to have faith, to trust in God, to have faith in him and his word. And then we get to chapter 16. A month after leaving Egypt, the Israelites are still in the desert. And we read that the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Uh, at this point, you can't help feel sorry for Moses and Aaron. How many people have fled Egypt at this point? Hundreds of thousands, I think Emma said a few weeks ago. <coughs> have you ever seen one of those reality TV programmes where... In the airport, the ones in the airport, where you've got that lone person behind the desk and a flight gets cancelled or delayed and the horde of people that go up, Moses and Aaron and hundreds of thousands of people grumbling at them. There's no comparison because the passage says it was the whole congregation of the people of Israel, of Israel that are on their case. And it's almost like the people, the Israelites, when they look back to Egypt and they talk about full meat pots and bread, that they've forgotten that they've been delivered, what they've been delivered from. They're talking about the old days somehow being so much better, so much better even with oppression and unreasonable demands for bricks and lashings of the slave masters. In their grumbling against Moses and Aaron, they're in effect grumbling against God. Because they're now of a mindset that God has brought them out of Egypt to do them even more harm. At this point, they've missed and failed the testing at the end of chapter 15 to diligently listen to the voice of God, to trust him and have faith in him. It's uh, as if they knew nothing of God. They'd forgotten the signs and wonders leading up to, the, uh, up to this point of his power and provision. And what does God do next? Despite the grumbling against him, he provides for them yet again with another test. With a clear set of instructions. It's another test of trust and faith. So in the evening, we see meat in the form of quail. And in the morning after the dew had gone, we read about a flake-like substance on the ground that's referred to as bread. And this substance is something people had never seen before. And we know, it's called, you know, we know now it's called manna. That it would be, that the Israelites called it manna. And apparently the word manna simply means, what is it? 
You can imagine breakfast, can't you? What's for breakfast today, Mum? What is it? No, I'm asking what's for breakfast. So instructions are given on the collection and storage of manna. But note, look how some people took more than they needed. And despite God's provision, they could not trust his word that they will have their fill. But the most important thing is it's bread that God has given. So here we are today. We've been freed from the slavery of sin, from that dominion, if you, if you like, of darkness by the ultimate Passover lamb. Jesus on that cross of, at Calvary, we've had our back, baptism, but we're still wandering in the wilderness, awaiting entry into the promised land. Manna is bread from heaven, but what does it point to? The simple answer is that manna points us towards communion and therefore it points us towards Jesus. Now the resurrection aside, there is only one miracle that can be found in all four Gospels and that's the feeding of the 5,000. And to be recorded four times, it's obviously a key event and I wonder why. So let's have a look at the feeding of the 5,000 as it appears in John chapter 6. It says this. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. Have you noticed how many important things happen in the Bible on mountaintops. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes and then seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we going to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii's worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here that has five barley lo loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so met the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted, their fill. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five burly loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is come into this world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by, him, mountain by himself. Where are these people? They're out in the middle of, no we read they're out in the middle of nowhere, in the hills, in the wilderness. And here are all those people who are miraculously fed. What are they fed with? Bread and meat, loaves and fish. And if you were a Jew at that time, you would have known the Exodus story. You would have heard of God's deliverance of your people from slavery, the signs and wonders, plagues, Passover, crossing the Red Sea, and all of those wanderings in the wilderness. And of course, you'd have known about manna. And perhaps this is why it appears in all four Gospels, to make a point that Jesus is the Messiah. That this miracle links right back to the story of the deliverance of the Israelites from the Egyptians. Of the quail and manna in Exodus. And some of these people obviously knew their Old Testament. They start to see Jesus for who he really is. They make that connection back to the Old Testament, back to Exodus, and, 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 other, and some other places in Deuteronomy, for example. And what Moses says of who is about to come. Then we get the account of Jesus walking on water. And it's important to know how Jesus refers to himself in this. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea and got into a boat, 
and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near to the boat. And they were frightened. And he said to them, and this is the key word, I am here, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the, was at the land which, to which they were going. It's that I am thing again, the I am from the burning bush. Jesus is making a real point about who he is. And when connections like this start to get uncovered, I, get, I don't know about you, but I get a little tingle on the back of my neck and a sense of excitement to see how the New Testament really does start to translate or interpret the Old Testament. And then we get to the next day, and this is where it gets, starts to get really exciting. You see, Jesus is going to tell the crowd and us that the bread in the wilderness in the book of Exodus was always a signpost to him. The people from the day before track down Jesus and he says this to them. Truly, truly, and that truly, truly is a really important thing. That is bold text, underlined. He's making a real point here. Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then the people ask Jesus a really important question. What must we be doing? What must we do to be doing the works of God? I was thinking on this. Note that the people ask what they work, they ask about works plural. And it's as much about what Jesus doesn't say as, as what he does say when he responds. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Not the works of God. He doesn't give a long list of things that need doing. He just says the work of God is singular, to believe in him whom he has sent. Then the people ask, what are you going to do to show us? What what sign are you going to give us to show us, to to make us believe in you? And it says in the passage, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And this is the benchmark of those people, that God's provision is bread and meat in the wilderness. And this is what Jesus says. Jesus says to them that word again, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. You see, the bread and manna in the wilderness is a signpost. Where did the bread come from? Where did the manna come from? It comes from heaven. Who does it point to? It points to Jesus. He is the true and everlasting bread of heaven. And the people say to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus replies, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes with me shall not thirst. And here again, we we find Jesus using the term, I am. And the passage goes on to say, But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of, who, of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all, of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Do you believe that? Remember, remember earlier when Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. Do you believe that? Are you doing the work of God? And then we come back to a familiar story. So the Jews grumbled. That's a great word, isn't it? Grumbled. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? 
The Israelites are grumbling again. Who are they grumbling against? They're grumbling against God. And Jesus comes back and says, don't grumble amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will be taught by my God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, again, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate in the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living, I am, again, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I would give for the life of the world is my flesh. And then Jesus goes on to say, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. You see, on the night our, our Lord was betrayed, he was given bread and he gave thanks and he broke it, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. What can we clearly see when we look back at the grumbling is that these people were missing the promises of God. When we come to the communion table, every time we do this, we leave with this promise that the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. In faith, you believe that Jesus, God's only begotten son, took the punishment for your sins when he died on that cross at Calvary so that you can have eternal life. When doubts come knocking at your door and we make things so overcomplicated that we end up doubting our salvation, that we're not good enough, or we're not doing the works, remember, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Actually, folks, it's not very complicated. It's quite easy. We just make it complicated. 